Well, good afternoon. Welcome to our Don OSBP Lunch and Learn session. On behalf of OSBP, we thank you for joining us today. We started this webinar series as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic as a way to continue outreach. With such an amazing response, Don OSBP will now transition to a Lunch and Learn series. Our goal is to keep our audience connected and informed while providing timely and relevant insights on the topics impacting the Department of the Navy's small business community and our partners by hosting at least two webinars per month. The Don recognizes small businesses are the catalyst of innovation and we use this platform as a way to attract new business partners. You can view previously recorded events on our website under outreach and past events tab and visit our YouTube channel. I would like to direct you to our website at www.secnav.navy.mil forward slash small business, where you can find a wealth of information, including our Don OSBP operations plan, locate your small business professional, and find information on how to do business with the Don, including the command's long range acquisition forecast. To stay current on Don OSBP upcoming events, you can register for our mailing list on the homepage of our website. To stay up to date about upcoming industry days, commands, outreach, and in general what's happening across the Don, I encourage you to connect with us on our social media platforms, facebook.com slash donosbp, twitter.com slash don underscore osbp, and LinkedIn where you can search for Don OSBP. Today, we have a dynamic speaker, Mr. Greger. Mr. Greger is the Small Business Program Manager and is located at DCAA headquarters in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. In this capacity, he serves as the Program Manager and Audit Expert for the Small Business Program with responsibility to provide assistance, consultation, and internal control with regard to audit requirements and their application to small businesses. I hope you seize the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A feature on this platform. Okay, Mr. Greger, over to you. All right, thank you, Kendra. I appreciate that uh, uh, excellent introduction. Uh, welcome everyone, good afternoon. My name is Joe, uh, Joe Greger. Uh, before we start, um, let me go ahead and just do a quick introduction about myself. Uh, like you know, Kendra said, uh, I am the Small Business Program Manager for DCAA. Uh, I started my career, uh, actually it'll be, it'll be 19 years next March. Uh, I started uh, ni about 19 years ago. I graduated from college. Uh, I moved to, to the Northern Virginia area. Uh, originally grew up in Pittsburgh, PA. Uh, I got a position with, within DCAA as an auditor uh, and then kind of worked my way up, became a senior auditor, became a supervisory auditor, and then a branch manager. And then about, uh, I guess it's been about four years now, in 2018, uh, I rotated into the small business program manager position. Uh, so from a branch manager into, the, into this current, current role. And, you know, before the pandemic, I, I would travel quite a bit and do a lot of these webinars, uh, or I should say a lot of the trainings, uh, the, a lot of the training sessions in person, but, you know, obviously now with the pandemic, we're doing the webinars and uh, I still think they're, they're value added and I appreciate you guys attending and hopefully we'll have a great session today. So with that said, uh, I will share my screen and uh, I'll bring up the presentations. All right. Uh, so before we get into the uh, the technical area of, of, of today's uh, training topic, which is accounting system requirements, I always like to do a introduction and DCAA overview. I think this is a, a good, it's a quick presentation, but it's really good. Just if you're not familiar with DCAA, uh, I think it's just a nice overview and background uh, for DCAA. So 
uh, prior to 1965, all of the existing uh, military services, uh, or I should say all of the uh, military services had their own contract audit function. Uh, and so in 19, it was about 1962, the Secretary of Defense decided that it would be more efficient and more effective if a single organization, a single independent organization performed uh, these contract services. So in 1965, DCAA was established by transferring all of the existing contract audit functions from each of the services into a single contract audit agency, which is which is now what we have, uh, DCAA, Defense Contract Audit Agency. We have oversight of, of about 9,000 contractors every year. We average more than 3,400 audits and examine more than $350 billion of contract costs. So, you know, we have a pretty big reach. This slide here just shows you our mission. As you can see, together with our acquisition partners, we increase warfighter capabilities by delivering high quality audits and financial services to achieve fair and reasonable prices. Now, you know, if you look at that mission, it's really in line with kind of our role within the financial oversight. So our role is to perform, uh, you know, uh, contract audits, um, which is critical to ensure that DOD gets the best value for every dollar spent on defense contracting. So that's kind of where you see, you know, fair and reasonable and also where we, we, where we protect taxpayer dollars as well. Okay. Now, if you look at DCIA as a whole, uh, we have about 4,600 employees. We're located all throughout the U.S. We have about 300 offices. Mostly those offices are in the U.S., but I do know we have an office in, in Wiesbaden, Germany, and we also have an office in Hawaii. We may have some smaller offices scattered throughout uh, in the Middle East. I know, you know, after 9-11, uh, we had a much larger presence there. Uh, since then, I think we have, um, you know, we, we don't have quite as large of a presence, if any presence at all. But um, I do know we had some offices there. So our primary responsibilities and duties, because we are a DOD agency we, and we're an office, we perform all needed contract audits for DOD. We do some work for non-DOD as well. So, you know, I know right now we, we actually do quite a bit with, uh, with NASA, Department of Energy, uh, and also GSA. Uh, typically that's done on a reimbursable basis. So meaning, the, you know, that government agency pays the CAA for, for any audit services. We also have a group of auditors we call financial liaison advisors. And they don't really, they don't perform audits per se, but they do provide accounting and financial services to DOD and also non-DOD, all right? This slide here just shows DCAA, where it's placed uh, within the overall DOD organization. We operate under the authority, direction, and control of the Undersecretary of Defense Comptroller. We are separate, organizationally, we are separate and independent from all of the services and also DCMA. DCMA is Defense Contract Management Agency. And if you've never heard of them, they primarily perform a lot of the uh, contract management functions. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, let's say the Army or the Navy would uh, award a contract and they would delegate authority to DCMA to perform those, you know, those, those, those contract, uh, those contract administrative functions. All right. And so the reason why we have this, you know, type of organizational structure is for our independence. Okay, so DCA has to follow government auditing standards for every audit that we perform. And if you actually take a look at our standards, you'll see one of them is independence. So we have to be independent of the contractor, which is the auditee, but we also have to be independent of all the end user of our of our audit services and that's typically those people within the procurement uh on the procurement side of things that make procurement decisions all right so this slide just shows uh dcaa's uh, organization our director is miss anita bells our deputy is joe bentz the left column just represents uh the groups within headquarters uh i my position is a headquarters position and i fall under uh, operations the middle column represents the different regions that we have. 
as you can see, we have Eastern, Central, and Western. Field detachment isn't necessarily a region per se, but it's a group of auditors that primarily audit classified contracts, okay? So if you're a small business out there and you have, let's say, the, the preponderance of your work is all classified, then you would be audited by field detachment as opposed to, let's say, Eastern region, okay? Then the right column there, we... Um, uh, DCA has sort of made the decision to align themselves organizationally with, with, with some of the large defense contractors. And as you can see, we have what's called corporate audit directorates or CAD for short. And then we do have four of them. So Northrop Grumman, Boeing, uh, GED, Raytheon, and then also Lockheed Martin and BAE. Now, I mentioned the regions, and this slide here just kind of shows geographically where those regions, where they operate, uh, and, and geographically where they're located. So along the East Coast, primarily is going to be the Eastern region. So if you're a small business you're, and you're located, you know, anywhere within Virginia or D.C. or even Maryland, for that matter, you would fall under Eastern region, okay? The orange section is, is the Central region, and then the green is Western. And then also the, the, the CADs that I mentioned or the corporate audit director, it's sort of located throughout the country as well. Uh, here in Northern Virginia, um, we do have one. We have the North of Bremen CAD, which is in McLean, Virginia. Mr. Gregor, we did have a question come in. Sure. So is there a dollar threshold for audits? Uh, so, so the only dollar threshold that I'm aware of uh, really would be with the proposals, with the, with the cost proposals. So, and what, and so what that means is uh, when a contractor submits a cost proposal to the government, if it meets a certain dollar threshold, then it could be audited by DCA. It doesn't mean it has to be audited, okay? Uh, it, what it means is if it meets a certain dollar threshold, then it can be audited by DCA. And so the, the dollar threshold typically is going to be a $10 million fixed price proposal or a $100 million cost reimbursable. So, so it, if it's a cost type contract, that's $100 million or more, uh, it could be audited by DCA. So those are really the only dollar thresholds that I'm aware of. Um, there are some other thresholds that are dollar thresholds, but there's really no relevance to whether it, it's, it's, you know, whether we audit or not. But yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. Just one more just came in. Can you uh, sure. describe the acronym? What does the acronym CAD mean? C-A-D. Oh, CAD. So that just, it, it, that represents or it stands for Corporate Audit uh, Directorate. So uh, and, and that's just really a DCA kind of internal thing that we have. Like I said, we've sort of organized ourselves. Uh, we, we sort of aligned ourselves with the large defense contractors. So we have a whole structure of management and, and audit teams that audit just those large defense contractors. And we call them CADs, Corporate Audit Directorates. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, if you're a small business, you know, you're, you're sort of a ma small mom and pop shop, or even if you're kind of a mid-size or, or like a mid to large size company, in, in all likelihood, you'll fall under the regions. Okay. So, you know, you, you know, basically if, if you're, if you're not Lockheed Martin, Boeing, you know, Raytheon, those big guys, you'll, you'll fall under the regions. Okay. Yeah. Excellent question. So, all right. Well, let me let me move forward with this slide here. So uh, one of the one of the more common questions that I'll get from small businesses, uh, you know, they'll contact me and say, "Hey, hey, Joe, who is my cognizant DCAA office?" Right? Uh, and, and and quite honestly, I'll, I'll get questions from 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 federal employees as well. You know, contacting officers, of course, throughout the government uh, will, will ask that question as well. So. I think it's a hand, I think it's worth noting our public website, uh, www.dca.mil. There's a lot of resources there, not only just for small businesses, but also for uh, people within within government, within the kind of the, the procurement and acquisition world. Uh, so, so we have what's called a locator 
uh, a locator function on, on our website. So if you go to our, our website under the locator tab, just go to the US CONUS and then you'll get this page here. And then you just select a type of search and then you enter that search in the, in the field. And then, uh, and then hopefully at least you'll get, you'll get your FAO, you'll get your DCAA office. Sometimes this doesn't work because this is basically just a database. If you're not in our database, then you may not get any results. Okay. Typically the reason why you would not be in our database is because you're brand new. Uh, you know, DCA doesn't have any experience with you. Okay. And so if that's the case, then we're not going to even know you exist. Right. So, so you're not going to be in our database. So I would just recommend contacting me. Uh, I have my contact information on a slide coming up very shortly, but I would just recommend if you do need uh, your cognizant DCA office and you can't find it here, just just shoot me an email and I can I can look that up. Okay. All right. So this slide here just sort of represents some of the audits that we could perform during the various stages of uh, the the procurement cycle. Okay. And you know, another question that I will get is, you know, people will ask, hey, what, what, what's the most common type of DCA audit, right? What's the most common audit that we perform? And if you sort of look at our, um, if you kind of look at our, our, our workload uh, matrix, uh, by far the two audits that we, that we perform the most is going to be incur cost and also price proposal audits, okay? Auditing your cost estimates, right? So those two audits combined, I think, is around 62% of the work that we do. So the, that it's, you know, pretty, pretty big, pr pretty big percentage. But, you know, we, we do other work, right? So I think it's worth noting um, some of the other things that we do. So, and again, we kind of break this down during the different phases of the contract. So typically when you submit your proposal, right? So just before being awarded the contract, DCA can audit your proposal, like I mentioned, but the other common audit, especially with small businesses, is the pre-award accounting system audit, okay? And so that kind of audit, and, and so I'll, I'll talk more in detail about that, but that's very important to understand what those criteria are, okay? As we kind of move through the cycle here during contract performance, you know, this obviously is, is you know, you're awarded the contract and now you're you know, you're actually executing on the contract, right? So, so that's where, in terms of the number of audits that we perform, that's really the bulk of, of, of our work. Uh, I mentioned incur costs, but we could do a lot of things such as, you know, looking at interim payments. We can do, um, you know, real-time labor evaluations. We could do TINA compliance audits. We can do equitable, equitable adjustments, right? So on and so forth. Uh, as a small business, just understand you are exempt from certain things. Uh, so you're exempt from cost accounting standards. So you, normally you'll see that as CAS, CAS, CAS compliance audits. CAS just stands for cost accounting standards. So that's one, that's, that's a set of regulations that are, that are not applicable to small businesses. And then also business system compliance audits, right? Those are audits where we look at your, uh, business system or your, or the, the large, you know, these sort of large systems that you have in place whether it's accounting, whether it's purchasing, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Those audits typically we do at the larger contractors. We're not gonna, you know, if you're a small, you know, let's say $5 million, you know, government uh, contractor, you know, we're not gonna do, you know, we're not gonna perform and, and expend resources to do that kind of audit on, on a small business. And then at the end of the contract, okay, uh, DCA, Honestly, we're not involved a whole lot at the end, but sometimes we can be asked to assist with uh, a, a final voucher. In some situations, uh, let's say the government terminates the audit, um, you know, for whatever reason. And if certain criteria are met, DCA can perform what's called a termination uh, proposal audit, right? Where the contractor submits a termination proposal and we can audit that, okay? So that's so that kind of gives you an idea of the different audit services we can provide during the different stages of the award, okay? Now, I mentioned our public website earlier, all of the training material that I give personally at, you know, whether it's a face-to-face -face event or whether it's a webinar, 
All of the training material is available on our public website. Again, that's www.dca.mil. Okay, so if, if you have if you haven't been there, I would recommend checking it out. Okay, uh, we we have uh, other uh, resources as well. We have some guidance there, audit guidance. We have checklists and tools. We also have some frequently asked questions uh, for contractors and for contracting officers. Okay, we also have some information on COVID nineteen as well. Okay, so again. A lot of information. I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, you know, whenever you get whenever you get a chance. Okay. So again, this is what the website looks like. If you're looking for guidance, it's under the customer tab. If you're looking for the checklist and tools, it's under the customer tab. And then under customer and then small business, uh, you'll see this page here, and this is where you'll get the the training material. Okay. Now I will say that. Um, our, our web page is actually changing. We're sort of working to uh, refine the small business uh, uh, portion of the website just to make it, uh, I think, more manageable, uh, make it more of a one-stop shop. You know, so all you have to go is, you know, all you have to do is go to one place and all the information is, is there at your fingertips. So hopefully we'll have the new website up and running, you know, by the end of the year. But in the meantime, this is where you can kind of go to get everything, okay? Now, this is my contact information here, okay? Uh, uh, you can write it down or, um, uh, you know, uh, you, you're free to, uh, I can send these slides to uh, Destiny or whoever and, and, you know, you guys are free to send these out to your small business suppliers, okay? But this is my email and my phone number, okay? All right, and that's the end of the uh, intro presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and queue up the next presentation, but in the meantime, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take those at this time. One question just came in. Uh, do you have any advice for small businesses about preparing for the business system audits, specifically once you're hitting about 75% of your next code's small business goal? Should you start working towards Operating within an improved accounting system. Uh, well, I mean, so I, I guess I'm not, I'm not fully understanding the question, but you know, accounting systems. So, so we'll be going over the requirements for the accounting system. To be quite honest with you, the bar or the standard, if you will, is fairly low. Uh, so, you know, the government, you know, that was done on purpose, right? So. We do not want small businesses to expend, you know, a lot of resources, time, energy, and money into getting an accounting system, and then and then not even getting the award, right? So that because that because that, that that does happen, and so the requirements for the accounting system is actually fairly low. So if you if you know what those are, then implementing them should be fairly straightforward. Uh, there's there's a lot of platforms out there. There's a lot of software accounting system software platforms out there. DCA doesn't really endorse any particular vendor. Uh, like I said, as long as whatever you use meets these requirements, then in, in, in DCA's eyes, at least, you know, you're, you're fine. You know, there, there, there should be any issues. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the only recommendation I have is really just understand what these requirements are and then you're free to choose whatever platform you want to use as long as it just meets meets these requirements. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start this presentation here. So today we'll be talking about accounting system requirements. All right, now, a couple of things with this. Before I start this presentation, I always like to sort of provide some context with, with this, okay? now. The accounting system requirements, okay, these, generally speaking, there's going to be uh, a couple of triggers for these, okay? And, you know, so basically what that means is uh, if you're a small business out there, it doesn't mean you have to comply with these uh, just because you have a government contract, okay? So the trigger, okay, is going to be any cost reimbursable contract. 
So if you're being awarded any cost reimbursable contract, okay, the most common is cost plus fixed fee, okay. But within DOD, uh, DOD also recognizes, you know, TNM contracts or cost reimbursable. And then you also have, you know, sort of the less, less common contracts like cost plus award fee, cost plus incentive fees, right? Um, so if any of those apply and you're being awarded those, that type of contract, then automatically you will be required to maintain an accounting system consistent with these uh, criteria, right? So just keep that in mind, okay? The other trigger is any fixed price contract with the progress payment clause, okay? The progress payment clause basically says that you can pay, that you can bill the government at cost based on meeting the, the milestones that are, agreed, that are agreed to in the contract. Okay, and we normally see those with, you know, like construction contracts, okay, where there's sort of, uh, you know, milestones that, that you agree to, okay, and if you have that, and if you have the progress payment clause in there, then you'd be required to maintain an accounting system consistent with these criteria, right? So those are the two triggers. If you just have just a plain old fixed price contract with the government, then you are not required to have an accounting system that meets these criteria, right? So just, just keep that in mind, okay? And so for, for, for a lot of small businesses, what, you know, sometimes what I'll hear is, you know, they'll, they'll be really, you know, anxious, right? Because, because they say, hey, I want to, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to make sure I'm in compliance with everything before I get my first contract. Well, you know, just, just just realize if 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 you have a fixed price contract, then you don't have to have an accounting system that meets these criteria. It's only when you're being considered for a cost reimbursable contract. Okay. Now, the purpose of of an accounting system audit is to evaluate the design of your system. Okay. Uh, typically, the the buying command or the the procuring office, uh, essentially the agency that will be awarding the contract, he or she would be responsible for determining whether you have an adequate accounting system, okay? If, if information on hand is not, uh, if they don't have enough information to make that decision, that's when they'll contact DCAA and request an audit, all right? So a lot of times I'll get small businesses asking, hey, I would like to request an audit. Unfortunately, contractors cannot request an audit, okay? DCA only responds to another, another federal entity that requests an audit because they are, you know, in the process of, of trying to award a contract, all right? So that's just a couple of things just to understand and just hopefully provide some context, okay? Now, I will say this, I will, you know, kind of a warning, if you will, um, the, the, the the first half of the presentation is pretty dry. It's a lot of theory, okay? And I'll do my best to sort of make it, you know, make it a little bit more realistic or, you know, just, just make it a little bit more uh, easily digestible, if you will. Uh, but there's a total of 18 DFARS criteria, and, I'll, and, and we'll go over all of those 18 criteria in this presentation. Now, the reason why we go over DFARS, because as you know, DFARS is the defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. So this is the supplement to the FAR. The DFAR supplement is much more, provides for much more clarity than, than the FAR. If you look at the FAR, FAR is pretty, uh, it, 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 it's, there really isn't a lot there. Um, so it, it makes it more difficult, I think, to try to compl comply with something that doesn't give you a lot, of, a lot of information. So the DFARS actually does a great job of sort of defining what the criteria is and it kind of talks about it in detail. And so that's what we'll, we'll discuss in this, in this presentation here, okay? All right, now this is the first criteria. And again, like I said, a lot of this is very uh, theoretical in nature. Uh, a lot of this is conceptual. You know, we'll, we'll sort of talk conceptually about cost accounting and, and cost theory and, and, and that kind of thing. So, so the first criteria here, this defines an acceptable accounting system. So basically what DFARS is saying here is 
you know, an acceptable accounting system has to meet these four criteria. So your system, whatever system you're using has to, uh, you know, it has to be uh, in, uh, in, in applicable laws and regulations, right? It has to comp comply with applicable laws and regulations. So an example of that would, would be you, your accounting system has to be GAGAS compliant, right? Generally accepted. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> GAP compliant, G-A-P, generally accepted accounting principles, right? So, so that's kind of what, that's an example of what they're referring to here with applicable laws and regulations. Okay, the accounting system has to be reliable. The, the data has to be reliable, all right? And, and I'm sure as you know, um, you know, any, any system out there, uh, you know, worth its salt, it has to be, it has to be reliable, right? The, the, the data, the information has to be reliable. The system itself has to minimize or reduce the risk of misallocation and mischarges. And then also the system has to be designed so that any invoices or billings that are produced have to be consistent with the cost, uh, the costs that are in, in your accounting system, okay? And so if you think about it, the only document the government sees is that bill. And so we have to have some assurance that the cost information is consistent with your accounting, uh, with your particular accounting system, all right? So from a very broad overview, these are the four things that defines an acceptable accounting system, all right? Let's move on to the, to, to the second criteria. We have a quick question. Oh yes, absolutely. Do the accounting system audits need to be conducted every three years or only on award of a new contract? Yeah, so there's there's really no there's really nothing set in stone that that says when an accounting system has to be performed. Uh, you know, typically DCA will perform an audit at the request of the government. Okay, and and in, and in my experience, what we see is when a contractor is, let's say, they're new, they don't have any experience. Okay, uh, and and DCA let's say, let's say, uh, you know, uh, a contractor has not been audited by DCA and all of a sudden the, the government is considering you for, you know, this, this cost type contract. Okay. Then that is when the contracting officer generally reaches out to DCA and requests an audit. Okay. So that is by far, you know, that, that is sort of the, the, the most common scenario that we would see. Okay. Now the whole every three year cycle, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I know when, when I was a, a, su a supervisor and branch manager, you know, we would get, um, sometimes we would get contracting officers that would, that would contact us and ask us, hey, can you perform another audit? Cause it's been X number of years, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think where that has come from is, you know, in some situations, contractors may change their system, okay? So maybe they went from QuickBooks, okay? But then all of a sudden, three, five years later, okay, they've become a much larger company, uh, much more complex operations, and they've decided to, to upgrade to a much more robust system. And let's say they're going with Deltec, right? So in that scenario, okay, it would make sense for DCA to perform another audit because things have changed, okay? Uh, the opposite would be true, or, or I guess I should say, if you look at the opposite scenario where, where a company, you know, receives a contract, we perform the audit, and then 10 years later, okay, uh, they're still working on, you know, a contract or other contracts, right? Their system hasn't changed. The people working there haven't, haven't changed. Their policies has, hasn't changed. Their race structure hasn't changed. Then I don't think it makes sense to do another audit just for the sake of doing another audit if nothing has changed. So, because because theoretically, if if their practices are have been the same, then there's really there really wouldn't be a need to perform another audit. Okay, so you know I guess my response to that would be is there's really no there's really no cycle, in, at least that I've seen, where we have to do an audit. Typically, the audit is done at the request of the contracting officer, and then later on, if circumstances have changed and there's a need for an audit, then we can do one. 
So I know, I know that was a long winded <laughs> response, but I think there's a lot of nuance to that, to that question. All right, so so then let me um, hopefully then answer your question. If not, you can contact me offline and, and we could discuss more. So with this with this slide here, this is the second criteria, and this sort of attempts to define your accounting system. All right, and and basically, if you, and and I'm not going to read the paragraph for you, but if you look at it, essentially what we're saying here is your accounting system is very complex. Okay, it, and it consists of not only the 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 platform or the software but it should also con it should also consist all of your policies and procedures it should consist of your desk manuals if you have subsystems uh, such as let's say a timekeeping system that isn't technically part of the accounting system but it's an add-on okay or it's just a separate module that you added on right sometimes you might have a separate billing um, system or payroll. Okay, so all those things in the aggregate really should be your accounting system. And it's not just any one, uh, it's not just any one thing, but it's all those things in the aggregate. And that's kind of what, that's kind of what we're trying to, to, to describe here. Okay. All right, now we're going to get into, this is the notion of total contract costs. And like I mentioned earlier, a lot of this is very conceptual. Okay. So just, so just bear with me. We'll, we'll, try to I'll try to make this as as clear as possible and so what this says is what we're saying is the total cost of a contract is all of your direct and indirect costs allocable to the contract right so that's the idea of total contract costs now you know typically when you think about total contract costs it's all of your costs allocable to the contract but also understand you also have costs that are that may be allowable or unallowable. Okay. And so even though costs that might be unallowable, okay, so let's say, for example, uh, alcohol, right? Everyone knows alcohol is an unallowable expense. However, it can still be allocable to the contract. And so the total cost of that contract has to ha has to include. Uh, those those costs that are allowable and unallowable, all right. And that and so when you think about total contract costs, it has to be all of your direct, all of your indirect, but also all of your allowable and unallowable costs. Okay. Now some of you might be saying, "Hey, I thought alcohol was unallowable. Why is it part of the contract?" And so that's that's a great question. So as it relates to your accounting system you want an accounting system that is that is designed to track all costs whether it's allowable or whether it's unallowable okay and so when you have a system that is able to do that okay then when you go to bill costs to the government you can look in the system or the system will, will be able to tell you hey here is my allowable cost on this contract and here is the unallowable cost on the contract so when you go to bill the government, you'll know exactly how much that you have to remove from the bill because you can't bill the government on allowable costs. Okay, and so that's the idea behind this this sort of concept of total contract costs. All right. Okay, so uh, uh, so this is uh, DFARS, uh, the second uh, criteria. This requires proper segregation of direct and indirect costs. So basically the accounting system has to be able to segregate costs uh, as either direct or indirect, okay? Direct costs, as you know, this is just basically a definition of direct costs. It's anything identified specifically with a contract, okay? An indirect cost is anything, any cost not directly identified with a single contract, but could be identified with two or more contracts or some indirect function okay you know a good example of indirect costs could be like let's say training let's say you're doing timesheet training right um, every company or i should say a lot of companies may require employees to perform timesheet training well you really can't identify timesheet training with a particular job 
right? So that so that's that's really considered an indirect cost, okay? Um, you know, versus let's say you're an, you're an engineer, okay, and you have a, an engineering contract with Army Corps of Engineers, and the contract requires you to have a certain certification, right? And so you're doing training to get that certification because you need it for that job. Well, in that case, I think you can argue that particular training might be considered a direct cost, right? So that's just a couple examples to just to maybe kind of bring this bring this full circle. Okay, so with direct costs, um, so we're talking Berger. a little bit. Oh, y yes. Oh, we, we do have two questions and I didn't want us to get too far along before we sure. um, answered them. So the first one, uh, touching back on a couple slides ago about frequency, um, do they audit our accounting only once for the pre-award or is this something that will be done on a periodic basis as long as we have a cost contract? Uh, are you referring to auditing the accounting system? So, so yeah, so in my experience, when, when DCA audits your accounting system, it's typically, it's typically because you're being considered for the, the, the cost reimbursable award. Once you are, once you are awarded the contract, then, uh, then DCA generally doesn't have any need to audit your accounting system again. Now, with that said, if, if something rises, uh, if something comes to our attention that may suggest there are deficiencies within the accounting system, then we may audit the system again, right? But but absent any any evidence or absent anything that would uh, come to our attention, then fr from from my from my point of view and from a DCA perspective, I don't see us auditing the system again. So okay. so you know, hopefully. hopefully Hopefully that answers the question, but if not, just, you know, let me know and we, and we can discuss further. Okay, our next question is, I have heard that DCAA compares salaries to government benchmarks. If a high-tech firm pays higher salaries than typical government contractors, can some of the salary cost be considered unallowable as it is higher than benchmarks for government contractors and deemed excessive compensation costs? Yeah, so you know, um, so th that that's a very uh, complex question. Uh, so what what I will say is yes, DCA we we have what's called an executive compensation group within DCAA, and typically when we audit your cost estimates, okay, what we would do is we would look at your estimated labor. Well, first of all, when we audit labor. Uh, we, we are going to look at the contractor's uh, underlying data that supports labor, okay? So that's number one. Number two, uh, one of the other things we'll also look at is uh, all the different indices that we have out there and compare your labor with these kind of ranges that we have out there, right? And so if we find that the estimated labor and if we use your example, engineering, if we find that you are, uh, let's say, overestimating, you know, given, given the size of your company and the industry, you know, et cetera, et cetera, then the amount that is over the range that we may have, we would, uh, I mean, we wouldn't deem it unallowable, but what we would say is uh, it may be unreasonable, right? And so, that's information that we we would provide to the contracting officer. So when they negotiate the contract with the contractor, they will have that information as part of the as part of the negotiation support. So that's that's kind of in a nutshell, uh, you, you know. But you know, again, the question is very it's very complex. I mean, there's a lot there's a lot of factors that go into that. And so you know, if you have more specifics, we can discuss that. But um, I'll just leave it at that. All right, any, any other questions? No, nope, that is all we have for okay. you. Okay, oh, perfect. Yeah, so these are great questions and I encourage you to keep sending them in if you have any. 
Uh, all right, so I'll, I'll move on. And, and so we're still talking about direct cost. And, and again, a lot of this is, is conceptual. And so what we're saying here is, um, you know, direct cost, if you think about direct cost, sometimes a direct cost is not just something that you that you'll see in the end product. Okay, so like, you know, if you're building a car, obviously, a car is gonna be made up of, you know, steel and, and, and plastic parts and rubber parts and that kind of thing. And so that you can see that in, in the end product, right? But, but what about the labor? Okay, so obviously somebody, uh, you know, had to, had to put some of that stuff together, right? You're not gonna see the labor in the end product, but the labor is still considered direct cost. So that's just something that you gotta think about um, with your particular company. And again, every company is gonna be a little bit different, okay? Now, the concept here, we say no final cost objective shall have allocated to it as a direct cost, any cost that has been included in the indirect cost pool. That, again, I know that's very uh, wordy there. Let me move to this slide because it's the same concept, but it's just talking about indirect cost. And so what we say here is an indirect cost is not to be allocated to a final cost objective, AKA contract, if other costs incurred for the same purpose and like circumstances have been included as a direct cost. So what we're saying here is if you incur an expense and that expense is incurred for the same purpose and like circumstances, then you want to make sure you treat that cost as either all direct or all indirect, but you never want to mix and match. You never want to, you know, let's say one day, be treated as direct and the next day it's the same purpose and like circumstance be treated as indirect. That would be in violation of this, of this concept here. Okay. And so an example of that could be, you know, let's say you're an engineer. Okay. And you're perform you're performing engineering functions on contract A and you treat it as direct, direct labor. But then let's say the next day you're performing, you know, engineering functions but it's contract b and, the, and then you treat your labor as indirect right so that would that that would be in violation of this principle here so in my example you'd want to treat it as all as all direct labor or if it's truly an indirect expense you want to treat it as just all indirect okay quick question yeah could we use consulting costs um in direct labor you can absolutely, yeah. Consulting costs can definitely be considered a direct, a direct charge. Absolutely. Great. And where can we find guidance on inclusion of overhead and administrative costs in a proposal? Well, I. I so so there. I mean, the the presentation that, that I'm going over now sort of will talk a little bit about overhead GNA. Uh, but there really isn't any place that I'm aware of that provides guidance. I mean, you know, overhead and GNA is really just, we're just talking about indirect expenses is really what we're talking about. Uh, so, I mean, we can, we can talk a little bit more in detail. Uh, if you have a more specific question, we could talk in more, more detail, but the accounting system requirements does kind of talk about indirect expenses, um, which, which I'm actually getting into here. So. Uh, let me go through some of these slides, and if, if you have a question that's a little bit more specific, then we can address that. Okay, now this is the fourth criteria. So this, we're talking about indirect cost, okay? And so what this criteria says is that you have to have a system that accumulates your indirect costs in a logical and consistent way, right? That's kind of what we're saying here, okay? And so typically, a lot of small businesses I see will have a fringe pool, an overhead pool, and a GNA pool. Okay, and so when you look at a fringe pool as an example, okay, all the expenses that you incur for fringe, okay, it's 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 reasonable to assume that you would uh, accumulate all those expenses because uh, they're 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 incurred for a very similar in a similar way, right? Uh, uh, if we if we go with overhead as an, another example, right? You, let's say you have an engineering. Let's say you have engineering contracts, and then you have manufacturing contracts, right? 
well, there's some expenses that you incur that might be more related to engineering function. And so it, it, may, it might make more sense to accumulate those costs in an engineering overhead pool. And then the same thing with the manufacturing contracts, there might be just some things you incur that are, that are uh, it's more logical to, to say that they're more manufacturing related. So you may have an overhead pool to accumulate those expenses, right? So that's kind of what, what this is talking about here is, is you want to make sure you accumulate your indirect expenses in a logical and consistent way, okay? Now, a couple of things. Um, I think the biggest takeaway here is that the indirect rate structure needs to be tailored to your company and how it operates. So, and so that's a decision that every business owner needs to make for themselves, right? So I mentioned fringe overhead GNA. That doesn't mean you should go out and just create a fringe overhead GNA. It needs to be uh, structured, tailored to your to your company, right? So I've seen, I personally have seen, you know, businesses that have just an overhead pool and a GNA pool. I've seen businesses that have three overhead pools in the GNA. I've seen businesses that have fringe three overheads in a GNA, right? So there's all different kinds of combinations, but the trick is to find the one that is that sort of suits how you operate, okay? Now for today's discussion, we'll talk about just the two broad categories, uh, which is overhead and GNA, okay? Now I mentioned uh, overhead. Okay, so overhead pools, um, generally an overhead expense uh, is, is, these are expenses that sort of benefit multiple contracts okay and so i've used the example of let's say you have engineering contracts and then you have manufacturing contracts right so expenses that sort of that sort of benefit your engineering function generally would be accumulated in an engineering overhead pool and the same thing with manufacturing okay these are some other examples okay material overhead uh, you might have a, an on-site or an off-site overhead. So I know like a lot of services, if you're like in the services industry, let's say you have, uh, you know, on-site generally refers to on the government site and then off-site generally refers to, uh, you know, not on the government site. So those, those are fairly common as well. Now with GNA, these are, typically your management, financial, and other expenses related to the general management and administration of the business unit. So just, just all those expenses that are necessary just to run a company, okay? And so some examples could be the salary and other costs of executive staff, right? You might have things like legal services, accounting services, you know, those kinds of things. Selling and marketing expenses, those kinds of things. So regardless of the number of contracts that you have, or regardless of whether you have contracts at all, there are just some expenses that you have to pay because you own a business, right? And typically those are going to be your g and expenses. Okay, so... Mr. Greg. You know, I... Yes, yes. I just wanted to let you know that we are close to time uh, for today's session. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let me let me ask you because I'm I'm only about halfway through, uh, and so if we're close to time, how do how do we how do we want to spend the rest? What do we have? Five minutes left? Are we? Do we go until two two p.m.? Yes, sir. Okay. So we we only have five minutes. Um, what I'm going to do is this, right? I'm gonna go ahead and skip through all this. And what I have is, I actually have some FAQs at the end of the presentation that I'll go over. And I, and I think these might be, you know, I think, I think there might be some value here, okay? Uh, and then in the meantime, if there's any questions that come through, just go ahead, go ahead and interrupt me and we can answer those questions. But let me go through these frequently asked questions, okay? So how do I get a DCA approved the government accounting system? This is, uh, you know, by far one of the most frequently asked questions that I get, okay? 
Uh, now, this is sort of somewhat of a misnomer because you can't get a DC approved DCA approved accounting system because there's no such thing as a DCA approved accounting system. Okay, uh, the system is actually approved by the the federal government or the command or procuring office that is awarding you the contract. Okay, that's that's really what's happening. And so, you know, like I said before earlier, contractors can really use anything they want as long as it meets the requirements. You should be okay. Um, I, I've seen a, a small business use Excel. Okay, and and so Excel can actually Excel does work. Okay, now you know it, it's not obviously it's not it's not automated, right? There there really isn't a lot of automation within Excel like there are with some of the more robust systems, but it can work. Okay, and so the point I'm making is you can really make anything work as long as it meets the criteria. Okay, and that's really the important part. How do I request an audit? Uh, I think I might have mentioned this earlier, but you can't request an audit. DCA only performs audits requested by uh, by some federal entity that that has the need or or they have the responsibility to determine if a contractor is responsible for the awards. So that's so that's really um, the process there. Uh, will the government accept a letter or report from a third party CPA for accounting system adequacy? In, mo in most cases, no. However, I, in my experience, I have seen a handful of contracting officers that they would accept a CPA or you know some independent public firm performing an accounting system audit. So I, I really think a lot of this comes down to the individual contracting officer, but in most cases, I would say they're, they're not going to. Is there an expiration date for the SF-1408? And when does it need to be updated? I think this is sort of very similar to the one question that we had where somebody had asked, hey, do I need to audit my system every three years, right? And so the answer to this is, you know, generally the SF-1408 is just a snapshot. It just represents a snapshot in time related to certain types of proposed contracts. So, you know, your, your accounting system as of, let's say, 2021, you know, we're saying it meets all the criteria. Okay, five years later, again, if, if the system hasn't changed, theoretically, there shouldn't be anything wrong with it. But that 1408 is just, rep is just for that sp specific period in time. Okay, and so whether we need to do another audit or not is really, you know, it's really based on a lot of other, other, other factors. Okay. Is QuickBooks or any other accounting software acceptable? Uh, an acceptable accounting system for federal contracting. So again, like I said, you can really use anything you want. Uh, I personally have seen QuickBooks. Many small businesses have used QuickBooks. And, you know, when I was a supervisor manager, you know, we audited a lot of small businesses and a lot of them use QuickBooks. And, and, and in, in most cases, we, we said it was fine, right? Um, I do know that QuickBooks there needs to, you need to sort of manipulate it a little bit so it does meet the criteria. But as long as you do that, I, I think you should be fine, okay? All right, and that's that's the end of the FAQs. Uh, I think we have a minute left. Um, if there's any other questions, I'll be happy to take those. Hello, so we are actually good for right now on questions. Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> okay, we then, have sure. one question that you can oh. go ahead and answer and then we can wrap up. Sorry, I guess I missed that. I'm sorry. No, it's that. fine. Is software development for product license to be sold later on considered a direct cost or should this be considered indirect GNA? Software development. So I, I would say in most cases that's going to be an indirect expense. More than likely, it's going to be what we call I R and D or or like a B and P costs. Uh, I R and D is uh, independent research and development costs. So that is going to be an indirect expense, and typically that that will be in the GNA pool. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And that was honestly our last question. This time. Sorry about that. All right, perfect. Well, uh, I, I, you know, I, I appreciate your time. I apologize I couldn't get through. I, 
I apologize. I didn't get through all the material, but I think we had a lot of great questions. And sometimes I find uh, the you know answering the questions, and if 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 people have a lot of the questions, I, I think addressing those is is more impactful than than going through just the material. So. So it looks like there is another question there um, for the per diem. Yes, for the per diem, do we calculate where the employee's hotel is or where they're visiting the customer? Uh, you know, that's that's a good question. Uh, typically, I, I mean, if you're traveling, let's say you're traveling to D.C., let's say you live in Florida and you're traveling to D.C., you're, you're meeting with the Navy, right? Uh, you know, I mean... I would say the hotel generally is going to be close to where your customers are located. So in, in my opinion, it's going to be roughly the same. It's going to be the same area. So I, I think it's going to be where, I think, I think ultimately it's going to be where the, the location of where you're traveling to, right? I, that's, that's, that's what I would say. Okay. Well, that is all that I see on my end. Um, I would like to say thank you for joining us today. Um, and for our audience, if you have any recommendations for a topic that you would like to see presented, please forward us an email at osbp.pao at navy.mil. Um, Mr. Gregor, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with all of us today. Um, and for everybody, please join us for our future webinars. We have one coming up uh, December 2nd at 1 p.m. We have Mr. John Kelly speaking to us from the Small Business Administration, giving us an overview of the Office of the National Investment. December 16th at 1 p.m., we have Ms. Kelly Kiernan. Uh, she'll be giving us an overview of the Cybersecurity Ask Me Anything. And on January 12th, we have Mr. Gregor again uh, speaking to us about the small business audit process. So definitely please come back and join us. All slides from today's session will be available on our website by the end of the week. And until next time, I hope you all have a great and safe week. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. Bye.